Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon, and this is a slightly different intro to the podcast today because if you listen to the last podcast, you'll know that we recorded a rather extra long episode about pets, and I divided it into two. So Last episode, episode 54, was about words for pets and the type of role pets played in the ancient and medieval world, and about dogs. And this episode, episode 55, is about cats and monkeys and other fun pets. But before we get to that, very quickly, I want to say thank you to our newest Patreon supporter, Nick Vervoort. Thank you very much for your pledge and for your support. We really appreciate it. And we want to remind everyone else that if you want to check out our Patreon, it's patreon.com slash endless knot. And any support you can give us there makes it easier for us to spend time making this podcast and the videos. Also, I want to apologize for the fact that this is coming out a week later than our usual scheduled every two weeks. Those of you who follow me on Twitter might know that A couple of things came together. I broke my right wrist a couple of weeks ago, and then soon after that happened, my computer crashed and had to be completely factory reset, and I had to re-put all my data back on it and everything. Anyway, those two things came together to make it impossible for me to get the podcast edited for its usual release date. So we're a week late, and we'll continue on from now every two weeks. So just so you know. Sorry about that, but I'm sure you understand. All right, without further ado, on to cats. On to cats? On to cats. So, the word cat. (laughs) Let me guess. We don't know where it comes from? Well, we can trace it back a little ways, Uh and there are some theories as to where it comes. So, we have a pretty good idea. Uh So, it appears in, in Old English as cat, Mm C-A-T-T, and that word appears in various Germanic languages. They all have borrowed it from a late Latin word, catus, Mm -hmm. replacing the the other Latin word, which we'll talk about in a minute. But it seems to have come ultimately, or this is the most likely guess, ultimately from an Afro-Asiatic language. So Nubian cadis, Mm -hmm. uh, Berber cadiska, both meaning cat. Mm -hmm seem to be cognates. There's Arabic kit, that Mm -hmm. means tomcat, maybe from that same source. So we don't know exactly what the source is, but there seem to be some cognates uh, in in the Afro-Asiatic languages. It doesn't seem bizarre. It doesn't seem bizarre. Cats Cats came from from that part of the world. So I forgot to say when we were talking about dogs, I didn't say anything about Latin words or Greek words because you covered that. Mm -hmm. But one of the words that's used quite often is catulus or catella. Yes. Right. I've seen that. U-L-U-S, mm-hmm. just the one L, not two, or Catella. So in the passages I read, for instance, mm-hmm. the dogs there are called Catella. Okay. That's that's how they're referred to, which the Romans saw as a diminutive of Canis. So the Latin, you know, they saw it as, but probably uh, isn't, huh. was a word that meant the young of an animal. Hmm. And then puppy becomes the it's most commonly used, but it could mean any young mammal. You right. Know baby animal, which is confusing because it looks like it should mean cat, Hmm. right? Catella or catulus makes you think it's going to mean cat, but it means puppy or dog. So it's quite confusing when you learn those words, (laughs) when you're learning Latin. I'd I'd run into that and I didn't know why. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting. That's That's where... I think we talked about that word, in fact, and I should make this call back. I don't remember which episode it was, but we do have an earlier episode quite a while ago that we did farm animals oh, yeah. and herding animals right. and agricultural mm-hmm. animals. We did. We may have do- talked about dogs a bit then, but we were talking about sheep and goats, goats and, and cows, cows and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So I'll link that in the notes as well. Sorry, to get back to cats, though. So to get back to cats, the, the Latin word that was kind of replaced mm-hmm. is the classical Latin word for cat, uh, phales. Yeah. This is another mystery word. <laughs> we don't know what the <laughs> ultimate origin of phales is. And it doesn't come from felix, though, meaning lucky, lucky. or fortunate. Yeah. Though, again, the Romans saw those, the Latins. And they kind of made a pun on sorry, that. The Romans saw those two as as connected. And mm-hmm. yes, you get felis and felix right. um, as being 
seeming connected. And so you, that's where, and that's why cats ended up with the name Felix. Felix, yeah. That's why yeah. modern, you know, well, the Romans may have had some of that, but really it's the humanists right. and, you know, the, the, the later Felix. who saw the Felix, Felix. Felix and, mm-hmm. and made that pun. And so you get cats being, and that's, you know, may have something to do with the nine lives and cats being lucky. And there's probably a bit of circular going back and forth there because there are other reasons that cats are seen as having supernatural powers. But that connection between luck and cats right. is very much partly because of the pun. Right. So, I mean, that's as far as that yeah. goes. We don't know where it comes from. So one more word is uh, specifically medieval Latin word. It doesn't, mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't used in classical Latin, mm-hmm. is muricaps, which literally means mouse catcher. Right designating its most important role. Mm -hmm. So the cat really does have another way of straddling that line between useful and not useful because they are interior. They live in the house, Mm -hmm. though they can live other places too. They can be barn cats, for instance. But house cats, even when they're house cats, especially not so much recently, but until not that long ago, even a house cat was there to catch vermin, at least in part. Or could be there to catch vermin. So you could have a cat that was catching vermin and then maybe other cats that were merely decorative. Right. But cats by, as a category, were not just. Category. (laughs) Were not just um, decorative. Yeah. And that becomes an important issue in the medieval thinking about the cat. Right. Which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. So I don't have a lot to say about classical cats because, in fact, cats are not a real feature of the classical antique world. Obviously, they're important in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And they are recognizing the Greeks and the Romans saw them as being Egyptian and it's coming from Egypt and recognize the importance of cats to the Egyptians and Herodotus has t- stories about people, somebody accident, a Roman, sorry, a Greek soldier accidentally killing a cat and being torn apart by a mob and, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. So you have recognition of their importance in Egypt. They do turn up in some art in Greek vases in a couple other places, though there's a number of places where there's a lot of argument about whether they're cats or dogs or something else uh-huh. because, you know, they're not terribly clearly represented. Mm-hmm. There are a couple of words as well that are like even feles, but especially the Greek words, ailuros and gale. It's not even completely clear if they mean cat all the time. Right. Or they seem to have come to mean cat, but in early, some of their earlier instances, they're sometimes thought to mean wild cat, Mm -hmm. like not a domesticated cat, and sometimes to mean weasel. Yeah, I saw a a gloss for that as Martin. Yeah, which is a kind of weasel. Kind of weasel, A a member of the weasel family. Then that, because weasels or members of the weasel Mm -hmm. family were kept as rodent killers. Right. So whether to call them pets, it's not clear. Maybe they were pets sometimes, but they were kept in houses and in other Mm -hmm. places as rodent killers because that's weasels are good at killing. And so in the context where that word, there's these words that are used of some kind of animal that's clearly kept to kill rodents, but it's really unclear what it is. Right. So they really weren't a major feature um, of Greek world. They become introduced into Rome. We know by the late Republic that they existed Mm -hmm. and started in the, but in the first century AD is really when you start to see them appearing as things that people know about. So both Seneca and Pliny mention house cats right. in passing in such a way that it doesn't seem like they're a newly introduced hmm. thing that nobody would know about. But we don't really, they don't become widespread and well-known and there aren't a lot of Roman references to them as pets. Hmm. The first use of that word catus is actually, it's only in the fourth century, so it's not so late, hmm. but it's an agricultural writer in three, around 350 who uses it. So I don't really have much to say about cats, much as I love them, they aren't much of a feature of the hmm. ancient world. And they really don't feature that widely in pet iconography. Mm. Well, in the Middle Ages, they have, again, this kind of ambiguous status because Mm. of the fact that they could also be used for catching a vermin. But nevertheless, they were still sometimes given special food, even though they could kind of make their meals out of the mice they catch. Puts them on the pet side of things. Puts them on the pet side of things. So one of the significant things about cats in the Middle Ages is they are seen as being both wild and tame. And this has sort of Mm -hmm. implications in terms of how they were seen as a symbol of things, which I'll get to in a minute. But first I wanted to say, talk about, you know, what what were the cats like in Mm -hmm. the Middle Ages? Uh, They're generally depicted as being gray with stripes. Hmm. Okay. Um, other colors were were <laughs> possible, but are available. <laughs> yeah, uh, but normally the picture, the depictions of cats sort of we see cat 
cat. Yeah, the cat. Ur-cat. <laughs> the Ur-cat in the Middle Ages, uh, gray with stripes. Okay. Contemporary accounts in the Middle Ages refer to the, uh, such things as them liking to be pet and mm-hmm. uh, responding by purring. Right. Uh, there's there's one mention of them. They sing their their own song when uh, they're being petted. Ah. <laughs> so that's, that's the purring. And their playfulness when they're young as kittens right. is, is noted in so- various sources. Going back to Hildegard, again, mm-hmm. you have to mention her. She describes them as unfaithful. Right, in in opposition to dogs. In opposition to dogs. Uh, that is a continued to the modern day opposition, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, basically, since they will only stay with whoever feeds them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, interestingly, so there's a bunch of Chaucerian references to cats. Uh-huh. In one manuscript of the Canterbury Tales, there are some added lines, so probably not written by Chaucer himself, okay. uh, added by someone else, describing the prior ass, who is in the genuine bits of, of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, uh, is, is noted for having dogs. And, and that's seen as kind of not being properly devoted to religion. Because she has pets? She has, yeah. She has these little lap dogs, which are kind of more upper class ladies would have these animals. And so she shouldn't be having such things. So in these uh, added lines, she is um, described as also having a cat. Okay. <laughs> uh, but there's some more interesting mentions of cats in the Canterbury Tales. In the Mansible Tale, a cat is compared to a wife. Right. Both being captive, in a sense, mm-hmm. and described as therefore being lustful. Right. <laughs> so this is the this is the medieval uh, anti feminist. Yeah, anti woman. Uh, they're not anti feminist because there's no. That's that's how it's usually it, described anti feminist literature in the Middle Ages. I guess just in the sense of anti feminine, like against females. Against females. Because yeah. they're not. It's just when you say it now, it mm, just makes it, it sound weird, like it's yeah. against those who are feminists. Feminist, and I yeah. don't think there's really anyone you could call a technical feminist right. in the Middle no. Ages. <laughs> so though the cat may be pampered, it still has its wild side. Here's the sort of tame and wild thing. Yeah. That that wild sti- side is still there and will chase a mouse. And so the woman, though she's been captured and tamed, made a wife, we'll she's still lustful after. and have affairs. That's the, uh-huh. that's the idea. And similarly, uh, the wife of Bath, one of the wife of Bath's husband's husband describes her as a cat. Right. With similar implications. Well, that's an ongoing gendered yes. comparison, right? Yeah. Women as cats. Women as cats. Just a second. So there are numerous negative associations with cats during the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. In terms of religious ones, they're associated with the devil. Right. Of course, this is all the witch stuff, right? The witchcraft, witch stuff, yeah. yeah. Which comes, no, no, I know the witchcraft is later. It's early modern. Later. Yeah. yeah. So the cat was seen as toying with a mouse just like the devil toys with the human soul. <laughs> I can sort of understand that. <laughs> Watching a mouse be played with by a cat is not exactly an example of human kindness. <laughs> and cats are also associated with specifically heresy. Oh, okay. The 12th century theologian Alain de Lille claimed that the name Cathar, heretic sect, oh, yeah. uh, the Cathars, came from the word cat. Which Cathar or cat doesn't. Doesn't, but, yeah, but they saw that connection. They saw that connection and said that the Cathars worshipped a black cat, who was the devil in disguise, and kissed its bottom. <laughs> okay. And indeed, one of the charges against the Knights Templar was the accusation that they worshipped a cat. Right. One of the many trumped up charges. Trumped up charges, yeah. yes. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Now, the common name given to cats during the Middle Ages is Gib. Short for Gilbert. Okay. Why? It's it's one of these sort of, you know, like you would call a dog Rex. Actually, they probably, if they really gave him a personalized name, they'd give him something different. But it's sort of the default. Yeah, I know. But, uh, but I, why Gilbert? I, I, I understand what standard names for animals are. Right. What I don't understand is why, why that Gib? name. Why Gilbert? Uh, like Fel- I just explained why Felix, Felix. is, is yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. a more common, more, common. more recent name. I don't know. It just is. There's so many references to Gib our cat. You know. Huh. That's what they called them. Okay. I mean, why are dogs named Rex? I don't know either. So. <laughs> Probably most famous, well, one of the two most famous uh, associations of cats in, in, with the Middle Ages is, of course, the, the famous pictures of a cat who jumped onto a just written manuscript page and yeah. left inky footprints across the page. Uh-huh. We'll put a picture of that in the show notes. There's actually, I didn't bring them up, but I, I can also put a link to a number. There's a whole bunch of cat markings on man, a couple of manuscripts and a bunch of tiles from the ancient world 
when with you, footprints of dogs, and, were wet. not cats, mostly dogs, that dog footprints uh, baked into clay tiles. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But the other really famous uh, cat in literary medieval circles is the poem about Pangor the cat. Mm -hmm. So I will read this poem to you. The Scholar and His Cat. I and White Pangor practice each of us his special art. His mind is set on hunting, mine on my special craft. I love, it is better than all fame, to be quiet beside my book, diligently pursuing knowledge. White Pangor does not envy me. He loves his childish craft. When the two of us, this tale never wearies us, are alone together in our house, we have something to which we may apply our skill, an endless sport. It is useful at times for a mouse to stick in his net, and as a result of warlike battlings. For my part, into my net falls some difficult rule of hard meaning. He directs his bright, perfect eye against an enclosing wall. Though my clear eye is very weak, I direct it against keenness of knowledge. He is joyful with swift movement when a mouse sticks in his sharp paw. I, too, am joyful when I understand a dearly loved difficult problem. <laughs> Though we be thus at any time, neither of us hinders the other. Each of us likes his craft, severally rejoicing in them. He it is who is master for himself of the work which he does every day. I can perform my own work directed at understanding clearly what is difficult. Very nice. So there you go. Academic cats. <laughs> All right. From cats to monkeys? Monkeys. So monkey is actually a late word. It's not a medieval word. The The medieval word is, is I guess, the same as what in Latin, simia. Yeah. Monkey is, you know, disputed in terms of its source. There are a number of theories as to where the word monkey comes from. It may come from Middle Low German, Middle Dutch word, which is a diminutive of some Romance word that's not entirely identified. So there are words like uh, Old Italian Mona and, and Spanish Mona, referring to apes or monkeys. Another idea is uh, it may have, that it may have been influenced by folk etymology from word Mona, meaning woman, a contraction of Madonna okay. in Italian. Mm -hmm. So basically that's, and as much as we can say, there may be an Arabic source, Maimun, which means monkey. Uh, literally, it means auspicious. So it's kind of a euphemistic mm. usage. But ultimately, we, we just don't know. Right. There's, there's a number of theories. None of them are very well documented, basically. Okay. Simia, of course, is the word gives us simian. Yes. So simian or simia uh, comes from Greek, mm -hmm. simos, which means literally snub-nosed. Mm -hmm. And it's used to mean that in other contexts. Like it doesn't always mean ape-like no. or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. So people could be described as snub-nosed. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't know where that word comes from. Right. Okay. <laughs> the, the original English word that was used to refer to monkeys and apes is the word ape, basically, in Old English, apa. Okay. So that in English continues to be the, the word until monkey comes in and then they get right. kind of eventually distinct, you know, D differentiated, differentiated scientifically, between but, apes yeah, and, and but monkeys, not until but later. not until much later. That word, apa, was probably borrowed perhaps from Celtic, a Celtic mm -hmm. word, because there are a number of seemingly connected, uh, like Old Irish apa, Welsh epa, or Slavonic. So there are a number of Slavonic cognates, Old Bohemian op, Slovak opitsa. Hmm. So there's some kind of relation going on there, but we don't really know what is the kind of ultimate source of it. Right. The whole group is probably comes from some Eastern or non-Indo-European language. Hmm. And that's okay. basically as, as far as we can tell. And right. which direction, what is the vector of the, that word uh, is not entirely certain. Hey. So those are the basic words for monkey. Um, so yeah, medieval words in English, ape or apa, mm -hmm. uh, and in the rest of Europe, some variant of simia or, you know, the Latin word mm -hmm. simia or some other variant of that. Right. Well, the reason we're bringing them up after dogs and cats is because monkeys were quite common pets in Middle Ages and in the ancient world. So we have much more references to monkeys as pets than we do to cats right. in the ancient Mediterranean. For instance, there's a, a monkey that plays a fair, uh, an, or an ape that 
plays a role in Plautus's play Miles Gloriosus. Not there's a slave that's always running around looking for the missing monkey. It's not that the monkey actually <laughs> plays a direct role, but okay. but the point is that it's a pet that's gone right, missing, okay. right? Mm-hmm. Like so, and it turns up a bunch of times. Um, monkeys are in art. There's a fair amount of monkeys that turn up in mosaics and mm-hmm. other kinds of art, and they're clearly little pets. They're long-tailed monkeys. Right. They're not apes not in apes. the mm-hmm. sense that we mean apes. And the monkeys could be trained to play flutes and do tricks. We have a story of monkeys <laughs> trained to ride goats and to hurl spears. So their they're human-like aspects were part of what made them entertaining. Mm. So they were used as entertainment, to not do just human as human pets. Activities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they're, we, we see them as pets, but they're also as entertainers. Right. Right. So like the organ grinder's monkey, right. they're, um, they turn up in places where performers, the, performers would have, yeah, yeah, yeah. would have a monkey to perform. Yeah. The other important um, place that monkeys turn up is Barbary apes in particular. There are mm-hmm. other kinds of monkeys in particular, but but particularly Barbary apes, that is apes from North Africa, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, the kind of ape monkeys that are on Gibraltar now, though right. they weren't on Gibraltar in the early part of the ancient world. Mm-hmm. They seem to have been a fairly common pet, and there are a number, or there are some finds of bodies, of bones of Barbary apes. Mm-hmm. And just when we were prepping for this, I saw Caitlin Green, who has a blog that I will point you to about um, archaeology in the British Isles, especially of late antique and early medieval evidence for trade and people from outside of the British Isles in the British Isles. That's Mm -hmm, sort of her mm -hmm. specialty. And she had a little thread on Twitter about finds of Barbary apes because there was a new one found. And she says, the majority of the finds of Barbary apes are of Roman and late antique date. Some were military mascots. So they seem to turn up in conjunction with forts and military forts. Right. Whilst others were clearly well-loved companion animals, for example, that one that is buried in a late 3rd century Poitiers next to its owner in a coffin and inside a large funerary enclosure. So there's more than one that were given, like that were buried in coffins that were given funeral rites, as it were. So I'll point you to her blog post about this because it's very interesting. But so that was just something to, to... bring up, they seem to have been associated with um, military in particular. Right Now, that may just be a find, the sort of bias of the find sources. We're more likely to find them if they were with military camps than if they were in somebody's home. But anyway, I thought that was interesting. Mm. Well, monkeys were not as common a pet, but they were. Uh, there were pet monkeys in the Middle Ages, the most popular of which were the, the long-tailed monkey. But Barbary apes were known and sometimes appear as pets in, in uh, medieval Europe. They generally had negative associations culturally. Right. So they were, because of their kind of human like right. appearance and so forth, they were seen as symbols of men's folly and vanity. Mm-hmm. They take on the worst qualities of men. Right. And in literature, they're always portrayed as being full of greed, malice, and devilment. In one fable, a monkey encourages the the pet dog, the pet monkey encourages the pet dog to pull the roasting chestnuts from the fire. The dog consequently gets his paws burned mm-hmm. and the monkey uh, eats, eats the chestnuts. Right. Yeah. So that's the kind of way that, that monkeys appear in a medieval context. The place I've seen them the most is in Marginalia. Yes. In the manuscripts, in the manuscripts, right? There's tons and tons of monkeys in the manuscripts yes. because they're a parody of humans. Yeah. And, and they're shown doing human things, you yeah, know, jousting. Because that's funny. And, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, playing that's... musical instruments and stuff. Yeah. And of course, as I said, the uh, the lady in the unicorn tapestry not Has only a features a dog, but a, a mon- pet monkey. All right. Moving on. To birds. Yeah. Of various sorts. Mm-hmm. So the word bird did not used to be the main word for the animal in for uh, the category yeah. for the category of animal in in old english mm-hmm. bird referred to young bird so specifically what we would now call a chick a chick or something mm-hmm. like that the main word was fowl mm-hmm. and that became later on narrowed to uh, referring only to farmyard domesticated domesticated yeah. birds yeah. food birds food birds yeah. so bird may be related to brood mm-hmm. young so the young animal the young mm-hmm. chick you talk about this. In I talked cuckold. about this in a previous video. In yeah. uh, cuckold. Yeah. In cuckold. The Latin word, of course, is avis or avis in yes. classical pronunciation, from which we get the word, obviously, avian. Mm-hmm. So that is traceable back to a Proto-Indo-European root that means bird. Right. Owie. There's not really much to say about that. Yeah, but at least we know where it's from. <laughs> but we know where it's from. Yeah. So this one is not a mystery. Well, it's except clear. bird is. 
a mystery. Bird is, yeah, a <laughs> bit of a true. mystery. Yeah. There's a theory, but yeah, yeah, it is a bit of a mystery. Yeah, and we won't go through all of the various words for all of the various all kinds of... All different kinds of birds, no. Yeah. Well, birds are a very common pet in the ancient world. And I would venture to say they are probably only after dogs the most common pet. And maybe if you include all of the birds, mm -hmm. more common than dogs, as pets, mm -hmm. as opposed to mm -hmm. as uh, hunting dogs. Now, they these ones are associated in particular with women, really, really strongly associated with women. So birds, pet birds are a, a thing. And on Greek pottery, you see them in women's boudoirs, like an internal bedroom sort of in, inside the house scenes. Mm -hmm. Birds are very common associated. But they're all kinds of birds. So on Greek pottery, for instance, Cranes, herons, roosters, quails, swans, ducks, and geese are mm -hmm. all common. And the, I've got to say, the cranes and herons are particularly surprising to me there as pets. Again, to the Odyssey, Odysseus has his dog. Penelope has her geese. They're geese, so they're domestic animals. They're a flock. But she loved them, and they came and fed from her hand. Mm -hmm. And she loved them as if they were her children, it mm -hmm. says. So, I mean, again, it's that sort of like Odysseus and his hunting dog. It's straddles the boundary, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, it's an important one. Quail and partridge were known as the pet of Diana or Artemis. Okay. The, the kind of bird probably we see the most in Roman context is the dove or pigeon okay. and sparrow. Right. So these are the very common. And they're associated really strongly with young women and young girls. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of them on gravestones and there's a lot of images of them. And then the, f and the famous sparrow that we've mentioned multiple times already is Catullus's sparrow. Now, it's not actually Catullus's sparrow. It's his girlfriend's, girlfriend's sparrow. sparrow. Right. But the reason it's, it's famous for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons it's famous is it's the first real poem in the collection of his as we have. That is, there is one poem before. It's a dedication poem. But it's the first sort of poem that proper. And the first word of it is passer, which is mm -hmm. the word for sparrow. And that seems to be how his whole book of poetry or one of his books of poetry was known in mm -hmm. the ancient world. So they, they talk about Catullus as passer, meaning his book of poems, because they didn't have titles. So it becomes even more famous. But the, the poem of, that, that sets off all the other poems <laughs> about birds is passer delicii mei puellae. Passer, the pet of my girl. We looked up delicii just earlier to see, because that is the word for pet. And it seems to mean beloved thing mm -hmm. from a word root you said. Uh, a proto-italic root that means snare. Yeah, something that ensnares you, mm -hmm. something that captures you. So, Sparrow, my lesbia's darling pet, her playmate whom she loves to let perch in her bosom and then tease with tantalizing fingertips, provoking angry little nips. For my bright beauty seems to get a kind of pleasure from these games, even relief, this being her way, I think, of damping down the flames of passion. I wish I could play silly games with you, too, to ease my worries and my miseries. That's the whole poem. <laughs> um, and I wonder if that's part of this whole idea of giving your mistress a pet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. comes mm -hmm. partly from this. So there's that poem, which would probably be famous in and of itself. But it's most famous because the next full poem mm -hmm. in our that we have is a epitaph for this sparrow. <laughs> and this is one of these humorous epitaphs. Mm. O oh, Venus and you Cupids, shed a tear, and all in man that's moved by beauty, mourn. Her sparrow's dead. My darling's darling, whom she loved more than she loves her own sweet eyes, her honey of a bird. It knew its mistress as babes recognized their mothers, and it never flew out of her lap, but all day long, hopping and flitting to and fro, piped to her private ear its song. Nevertheless, now it must go down the dark road from which they say no one returns. Curse you, you spiteful, swooping hawks of death, who prey on all things that make life delightful. That was a pretty bird you took. Bad deed. Poor little bird. By dying, see what you've done. Her sweet eyes look all puffed and rosy red with crying. <laughs> this translation, by the way, is the translation by James Mitchie, and is a little bit... um precious in that it has like rhymes and stuff mm, and it's not mm -hmm. my total favorite but it's the one i had to hand it, it's fine though so that pair of poems made the sparrow particularly famous right. and inspired a lot of later imitators mm -hmm. and the famous imitator is an ovid poem mm -hmm. ovid imitates lots of people but he has a poem um about his girlfriend's bird right his bro girlfriend's bird is a parrot <laughs> Now, parrots, we know that they had um, mm -hmm. birds that we know in particular, they lo liked a lot of birds that were trained to imitate human speech. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. nightingales, 
not so much for human speech, but they liked to keep caged nightingales for their song. Mm -hmm. Starlings, ravens, magpies, and parrots were all kept and trained Mm -hmm. to imitate human speech. They also had peacocks that may or may not have been trained to speak. Don't really understand how they could have been. But anyway, peacocks are definitely a a pet sometimes too. I think that I could say so much about Ovid's poem, but I think it's very telling that his poem imitating Catullus Mm -hmm. about a sparrow is about a parrot the great imitator right, right, of speech, right? right, right? right? Mm-hmm. So this is a, it, it's a joke from the word go. Mm-hmm. Parrot, the mimic, the winged one from India's Orient is dead. This is book two, poem six of his Amores. Go birds in a flock and follow him to the grave. Go pious feathered ones, beat your breasts with your wings and mark your delicate cheeks with hard talons. Tear out your shaggy plumage instead of hair in mourning. Sound out your songs with long piping. Philomela, Mourning the crime of the Thracian tyrant, the years of your mourning are complete. Divert your lament to the death of a rare bird. Itis is a great but ancient reason for grief. Philomela being the name of the nightingale, having been turned into that because right. her son Itis is dead. She mourned so long for her son Itis, who died. Hmm. And basically, Ovid says, come on, he died a long time ago. Give it up for him. <laughs> Start grieving for this bird instead. <laughs> All who balance in flight in the flowing air, and you above others, his friend the turtle dove, grieve. All your lives you were in perfect concord and held firm in your faithfulness to the end. What the youth from Phocis was to Orestes of Argos, what she could be, parrot, turtle dove, was to you. What worth now your loyalty, your rare form and color, the clever way you altered the sound of your voice, what joy in the pleasure given you by our mistress. Unhappy one, glory of birds, you are certainly dead. You could dim emeralds matched to your fragile feathers, wearing a beak dyed scarlet spotted with saffron. No bird on earth could better copy a voice or reply so well with words in a lisping tone. You were snatched by envy. It goes on and on about quails and all other kinds of birds and how they're all horrible, but you are the best kind of bird. The parrot, the gift from the end of the earth is dead. It goes on and on and compares them to characters from Homer. <laughs> Yet still the words from his listless speak astonished, dying his tongue cried, Corinna, farewell. <laughs> and then it talks about his grave and the birds in the underworld where the swans, and the phoenix and the peacock are and the dove and the parrot gaining a place among those trees translates the pious birds in his own words. A, t- a tumulus holds his bones, a tumulus fitting his size, whose little stone carries lines appropriate for him. His grave holds one who pleased his mistress. His speech to me was cleverer than other birds. So that's his epitaph at the end in the poem. So it's an extremely silly poem, right? as is true of many of Ovid's poems. But you can see here the seeds of that genre that you were talking about earlier. But it's notable that these girls, these um, women who are mistresses, have pet birds. Mm -hmm. And that that's sort of a focal point of their identity. Right. So, yeah, so birds are are a very, very important pet in the ancient world. Well, indeed, that tradition of imitating Catullus continued yeah. right on yeah. uh, to the medieval scholars who wrote uh, various Latin elegies or whatever in Latin to birds, specifically sparrows. Right, right. That right. became the sort of common one. And they were probably not really connected with any real birds bird, but were just sort of exercises, literary exercises. Literary yeah. exercises. Well, so was Ovid's almost certainly, but yeah. yes. Yeah. I mean, for all we know, so was Catullus's. I'm always right. skeptical that there's any actual truth behind it, but it was plausible. Right. Girls did have, have pet, pet birds. birds. Right. Whether that was true in the Middle Ages, I don't know. I don't know if they had sparrows as pets. It's not one of the common ones, but yeah. it, it may be- Might have been possible. Might have been possible, yeah. So the Latin word for- Sparrow is passer. Mm-hmm. We're not absolutely sure where this comes from, <laughs> but uh, it one idea is that it may be imitative in origin. Mm-hmm. I don't know if the sound of a sparrow sounds like passer in any way. <laughs> well, it probably depends on the bird, but pss, 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 or something. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of different sounds yeah. that these little birds make. The other idea is that it comes from the Indo-European compound word petro, meaning basically one who flies, therefore a bird, uh, which comes from the the root pet, Mm -hmm. which means literally to rush or fly, Right. from which we get the word feather, among other things, and hippopotamus. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) Which were not kept as pets. No. The English word sparrow, on the other hand, comes from 
Proto-Germanic uh, Sparwan, which goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root Sporwo from the root Spare, which is uh, basically a root forming various bird names. So it's just a sort of Some generic sort of bird. bird. Right, right. <laughs> Okay. So in the Middle Ages, the common bird pet birds were included things like thrushes, nightingales, blackbirds, turtle doves, starlings, skylarks, magpies, finches. So mostly songbirds. Then. Mostly songbirds. Interesting. Yeah. That, I'll get to parrots in a minute because that, that was also yeah. a thing. That doesn't seem to have been so much why birds were kept. These these because all these girl little girls with pet mm. sparrows and stuff, they're always holding them in their hand or on their lap. Like they're very much playing with them. Mm -hmm. Like this isn't, they aren't in, sometimes in cages, but very rarely in cages. So they aren't really caged songbirds. They're, they're the kind of pets you play with. So a different kind of bird. Right. So I'm not going to etymologize all no, of no, those. No, no. We've been going on far too long already. <laughs> but there's a couple of etymologies that I want to give just because they're kind of amusing. Okay. So magpie, the mag part is a diminutive of Margaret. Right. And Pie, which can also be used of the bird just on its own, mm -hmm. it goes back to Latin pica, right. meaning magpie, right. and going back to a Proto-Indo-European root pake or spake, which is, again, another kind of general bird word, can refer to woodpeckers, magpies, various different types okay. of birds. But the word pie, as in the pastry, uh -huh. comes from magpie. Because of the idea that the magpie collects miscellaneous things. And a pie has a bunch of pie stuff in it. You, you, you make a pastry and just throw a bunch of stuff into it, whatever's around. That surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> I would not have predicted that. Okay. Uh, that, that particularly amused me. Mm -hmm. Well, then the four and 20 blackbirds baked in a pie. Yes, right. That's a whole mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. So thrush is an old English word, thrasha, that comes ultimately from Proto Indo European trosdo. Which meant, again, it's, I guess, one of these bird, general bird words, mm -hmm. uh, thrush, or at least other types of birds. But the interesting thing about that is it comes into Greek and is the second element of the word ostrich. Right. You, the, you I, did I a tweeted tweet. about you this. You did a tweet about yeah. this, yeah. So ostrich. ostriches are not kept as pets by the Romans. <laughs> they did have them sometimes in the arena, but they did not keep them as pets. Basically, it means big sparrow. Yeah, really <laughs> big, big sparrow. sparrow. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't get into it now, but in another previous video, I did the etymology of turtle dove. You can check out yes. our Christmas podcast episode on, on the, the 12, 12 days, days of Christmas. Of Christmas. You did a lot of bird etymologies in that. That's in true. Fact. A lot of if birds. You want birds. Yeah, bird etymologies, a bunch of them in there. Yeah. But the other particularly important bird in the Middle Ages is the parrot. Mm -hmm. They are the sort of premier, you know, status symbol yeah, kind of bird. Yeah, because they're foreign and, mm -hmm. and luxury, right? Now, the specific kind of parrot they had in medieval Europe was the Indian rose-ringed parakeet. Okay. That's, that's the, the type of parrot that was known. So the word parrot is, again, a late word. Um, mm -hmm. Only in, in the 1520s do we get the word parrot. Okay. In terms of its... Etymology, it may come from parakeet, in fact. Okay. Which also obviously comes into English, but even later than that, uh, not till the 1620s. But that word appears in Latin as parochus, which also gives us the words parochial. Oh, yeah. So in medieval Latin, it meant, parochus meant a parish priest. Right. Okay. So why is that a parrot? Why is that a parakeet, specifically? Yes. <laughs> So it basically, parakeet means literally little priest. Because they talk all the time? Probably in <laughs> reference to, well, maybe, but probably in reference to the head plumage. I guess it looked like a, a, a pre, uh, well. I guess no, because it would be a monk, a monk who has, the, who has cowl. the cowl. Yeah, that's true. I bet it was because they talked. They talked. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> oh, with repeating the same things. I mean, pre, not not just from preach um, preaching sermons, but like a priest does, after all, recite the same things over and over again, mm, right? It's mm -hmm. saying the prayers and stuff like that in a language that most of the people didn't know. So who knows? Maybe it is that. But I'm just, just a guess. But ultimately, that word goes back to ancient Greek, basically meaning... Para oikos, meaning yeah, para -oikos. those who live around. Yeah, yeah. neighbors, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah, para oikos. Yeah. yeah, I'm just trying to remember what the term I'm thinking of. Perioikoi, that's what I'm trying to think of. The perioikoi is the people who lived around the town but were not necessarily um, citizens. Right. Well, that, that root oikos mm -hmm. comes from Proto-Indo-European wake, which means clan or something right. like that. It means house in, in, in Greek. In Greek, yeah. Classical Greek. 
Hence the word economy, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But neither of those words uh, was used in the Middle Ages in English to refer to the bird. Instead, the the medieval the, the medieval English word for it uh, was popinjay. Right. Okay. Which is, if still known today, is known just to, as a like a foolish and vain kind yes. of person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which came into English from Old French, which got it from Spanish, which got it from Arabic. Hmm. Huh. Which came was not an, a native Arabic word, but in fact came from Persian. Okay. Babga, meaning parrot. And before that, it may have come from an African or non-Indo-European language. That's cool. <laughs> and the one thing that I want to say about parrot, other than, as I said, that they're a sort of high status symbol, uh-huh. is in sort of medieval symbolism, the parrot was associated with the Virgin Mary. Really? Yes. They were talking birds, right, and could be trained to say all kinds of human words. Mm-hmm. But it was believed that their by their nature, they would automatically be able to say one word only, and that you had to train them to say the other words. And that one word, I guess, was its natural call or something. Uh, but they thought it was Ave. Oh, as in Ave Maria. Yeah. So Ave was the greeting that the Archangel Gabriel gave to the Virgin Mary. Right. And so these birds are saying Ave all the time. <laughs> So they're starting the Hail Mary. They're starting the Hail Mary full of grace. They're yeah. starting to say their the rosary. rosary. So they became symbols of purity and, you know, as I said, right. associated with the Virgin Mary. So, huh. <laughs> All right, then. Ovid's poem must have been interesting to them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's birds. Okay, well, I think we need to stop because we've been talking far too long. And no matter how hard I edit this, this is going to be a really long episode. <laughs> So I just wanted to wrap up by just mentioning really quickly a few other pets, because actually the ancient world had a lot of different pets, Mm. which I mean, there's lots of other pets now too. But so just to list off a few that we see in art or mentioned in literature, hares, that is Mm -hmm. rabbits, but Mm -hmm. hares, cicadas, mice, deer, goats, squirrels, and turtles are Mm -hmm. all mentioned as animals that kids had. Mm Mm-hmm. Also, uh, exotic animals, mostly these are emperors who had them, but like pets living in the house and sleeping on their bed, lions, panthers, and bears. The Romans had mullets, which is a kind of fish. Fish, yeah. And in fish ponds, they were kept for food, but also um, some of them were apparently, it was often talked about as like the kind of luxury that was being decried was people who had fish ponds with mullets, large mullets that fed from their hands that mm-hmm. they loved more than they loved anything else right right uh, snakes we have some temple snakes is a thing but also some pet snakes including possibly tiberius so tony said pe- tiberius had a pet snake they were kept in households to destroy vermin and mice mm-hmm. harmless snakes so that would be where they kind of became pets from um marshall and seneca both mentioned pet snakes and then there's like a famous I mentioned deer, but there's a famous stag in the Aeneid who's a pet hmm. and like, gets ribbons on his antlers and things like that and mm-hmm. comes and feeds from the table and, and then is killed and it starts the war in, in um, accidentally and it starts the war in Italy. So, you know, there's mm-hmm. a couple of others. But just to show you, there's a fairly wide range of animals right. that could be kept as pets. And that that is to some extent true in the Middle Ages yeah. as well. Various weasel Right. Like animals. Like ferrets, ferrets now. And, and so yeah. forth, yeah. And yeah, squirrels. I've seen mm-hmm. pictures of squirrels on le- little leashes, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Yeah, adorable. Yeah. And if you believe medieval manuscripts, probably snails. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is with the medieval snail. It was, it's a it's whole, whole thing. thing. <laughs> but I don't think they're actually pet snails. No, probably not. <laughs> All right. Then I think that is enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'll post a bunch of pictures and some links people gave me for on Twitter and that you've mentioned. So mm-hmm. th- this should be a pretty good set of show notes if you want to see some medi- antique and uh, medieval pets. But I was going to say, let us know what your favorite pet is. But that's just something you don't want to start with the internet. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want a war between cat and dog lovers. So academic cats, I'm just saying. Yeah. But then I don't have any ancient academic sparrows <laughs> actually i do have i will say that I, in my twitter bio yeah. i do have a modified quote from that right. first catullus poem because he says hopping here and there it tweets in her ear and pipio is the verb that most of us have decided is the good latin for tweeting tweet. hmm. so i have who get to luke uh, here and there hopping here and there i tweet <laughs> in my twitter bio in latin because that's the kind of geek i am <laughs> all right let's leave it there 
And we'll be back in two weeks. Who knows with what? We have not planned that far ahead yet. Hmm. <laughs> so in the meantime, pet your pets. <laughs> and we'll be back soon. Bye-bye. Bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. Oh, here comes our pet to come to say hello. <laughs> our cat has come to join us. Step on my... now destroy everything. Purr into the microphone. <laughs>